Since the beginning of time, humanity has gone through cycles of growth and decay. Whenever civilizations have fallen apart, a divine messenger has appeared with new guidance for humanity. Whether it was Lord Krishna, Buddha, Moses, His Holiness Christ or the Prophet Muhammad, humanity has always received a new revelation just when things were at their worst. The world we live in today is exciting. We communicate at the speed of light and travel at the speed of sound. We've made incredible advances in science and technology. Our world is becoming a melting pot of diversity. At the same time, self-interest and exploitation have devastated our planet. Africa is a very long way to go. What we see all around the world is really the crumbling down of society. You can see all the things of abuse, rape, violence, all sorts of crime. There's no country where it is different. Everyone has got all the same problems. And our education system is rising and improving, but we've got the highest, second highest AIDS infection rate in South Africa. So you ask yourself, is it, what is it exactly? Where's the, where's the problem? Over 25,000 people die of hunger every day. More than half a million women and children are trafficked across borders each year. Religious conflicts have cost thousands of lives. While some people are losing hope and faith, others eagerly await the return of the Promised One, the Sat, the Messiah, Christ, or the Mehdi. But there is in fact one group of people in the world who believe that the Promised One has appeared, like a thief in the night, some 160 years ago. These people are the Baha'is. Their faith in Baha'u'llah gives them a concrete vision for a better world. I think the world is coming a better place now. The future of South Africa will, will become brighter. Eunice Mabasso runs an orphanage in Orange Farm. In her lifetime, she has been a mother to hundreds of children. I think this crime and poverty, we can solve it. The better world that I see is in the pair of glasses that are put on. I can look at the global affair and say, wow, it's an absolute mess and misery. Or I can look at the construction site, which is full of dust and mud and, and, and rubbish, and yet see in it the edifice that is rising. Dr. Irajabedian is one of South Africa's principal economists. He has participated in the country's most fundamental economic policy processes. Yeah, the extremes of wealth and poverty, uh, difficult and intractable as they appear, they are largely the product of the system that has evolved. And by replacing the system, the extremes will disappear. I, I firmly believe that we can tackle and uh, victoriously overcome these issues of AIDS, illiteracy and uh, poverty. Tahira Mati is an educationist and has spent over 20 years serving the education system in South Africa. For something to be successful, you need vision. Baha'i 
Others look at the world's chaos and see in it a brighter future. They believe that Baha'u'llah's teachings provide the blueprint for building a better world. Humanity um, has the ills that it displays today, and Baha'u'llah is the physician that has brought the divine remedy for the ills we are experiencing today. In the lives of Baha'is, faith is realized in service to humanity. Baha'u'llah told us that the eye of God is always watching me. I must always serve God. Baha'is believe that worship is best realized through work and that the time has come to build God's kingdom on earth. It is the process of creating an edifice that is attractive, that is awesome. It is that excitement. It's not about the future uh, where I will be dead and unfinished physically. That excites me. It's the construction site of building a new edifice. Um, so for the Baha'is, it's got a, a global force, a divine force, if you like, a divine objective, but also being a worker on the construction site. That's exciting. To be godly, to be religious, to be spiritual, all these things, the foundation of that lies in the degree to which we serve our human family. The Baha'i Faith counts some six million followers all over the world. In the latter half of the 19th century, Baha'u'llah taught that the earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. Religion has been shared with the human family in a way that it unfolds according to our measure and ability to understand. Baha'is believe that all of the world's major religions come from the same source and that they are really only different stages of one and the same unfolding revelation. Desire for your brother that which you desire for yourself. Blessed is he who prefereth his brother before himself. In a world where religious difference causes dissent and strife, isn't it nice to know there's a place we can all be one? To be a Baha'i, I must love and accept His Holiness Christ, that I love and respect His Holiness the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. All the other divine teachers, Buddha, Krishna, Zoroaster, Moses. And in fact all religions being one, they are composed of broadly two components, a moral foundation a certain set of principles, if you prefer Ten Commandments uh, of some sort or the other, and a set of do's and don'ts, guidelines, that governs social life and personal life within a society at a particular time in history. Some of Baha'u'llah's many teachings include letting go of all forms of prejudice, putting into practice the equality of women and men, and implementing universal education, especially for the girl child. The one teaching of Baha'u'llah that is so necessary for us to get right, it is our understanding that we are one. We, we, we are created from the same substance. All over the world, Baha'is try to build a better world by applying Baha'u'llah's teachings. The following are examples of South African Baha'is who try to do just that. Orange family, it's a more poorest area in Gauteng. There are no industries here where people that can, can be an employed here. Yunus Mabaso is better known as Mama Yunus to her fledglings. She began her orphanage as a way of responding to the challenges of the world around her. I had a son that when I was delivering a baby, the baby was already dead. I was realized that 
I can't have any baby anymore. In our culture, you are a woman because of having a baby. If you can't have a baby, they will not recognize you as a, a woman. When I, I start to ask my husband, can we adopt just one baby because I love children? My husband said to me, you must choose. If you still want to marry me, or you want to marry a love of children. Mama Eunice didn't have to make a choice because soon thereafter, her brother and his wife died in an accident, leaving her with the custody of four young children. She had to foster us, then that's how we left with her. Because she didn't have any children, so she was the only one in the family who didn't have any children, so she took us in. These children, they identify another offense that they were here around us. They were coming to say to me, Mom, at school, there is another offense that we wish you to, 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 to look after them as you are doing to us. I think it's a project that God picked me up from this community to do it. To be a Baha'i, to me, it gives me a, a, a light. What will happen after I leave this earth? You know, knowing Mama Yunus's story and the way she uh, chose to become, you know, a mother to all these kids and the way she discovered the Baha'i faith and how it instantly resonated with her spirit. And yeah, to, to see that it was, it was special. Walid Jassat is also a Baha'i and longtime friend of Mama Yunus. He has chosen to support Yunus by helping her with handiwork. Ooh. Ooh. The inspiration behind it is that Baha'u'llah um, says that service to mankind is a form of worship and it's the highest um, thing any, anyone can aspire to. So, you know, to serve Mama Yunus, who's serving mankind, it's, it's, uh, it's a special privilege. O oh, thou kind Lord, we are servants of thy threshold, taking shelter at thy holy door. We seek no refuge, save only the strong pillar. Turn nowhere for a haven, but unto thy safekeeping. Protect us, bless us, support us. Make us such that we shall love but thy good pleasure. Utter only thy praise, follow only thy pathway of truth that we may become rich enough to dispense with all save thee and receive our gifts from the sea of thy beneficence, that we may ever strive to exalt thy cause and to spread thy sweet savors far and wide, that we may be become oblivious of self and occupied only with thee and disown all else and be caught up in thee. O thou provider, O thou forgiver, grant us grace and loving kindness, thy gifts and thy bestowals and sustain us, that we may attain our goal. Thou art the powerful, the able, the knower, the seer, and verily thou art the generous, and verily thou art the all-merciful, and verily thou art the ever-forgiving, he to whom repentance is due, he who forgiveth even the most grievous of sins. Many analysts uh, look at Africa almost superficially with a pair of Western eyes glasses on. If you have those glasses on, you're absolutely right. Uh, because you see Africa as a, as a process of poverty trying to get to the Western standards of, of wealth and material achievements. Although he seems removed from Mama Eunice's world, Dr. Irajabedion is intricately connected to her and spends his life tackling much of the same problems. If you invert the debate and say, look, what does West need to get to a condition of humanity where care, where tolerance, where respect, where 
collective welfare as opposed to individual welfare. If you go that route, you see Africa as a different, uh, different uh, society, as a, as a different uh, perspective on humanity. In the Baha'i writings, there is a, an analogy that is used for Africa, that Africa is like the pupil of the eye of humanity. It is that focal point through which we could see the inside, or we can form a perspective. South Africa has just come out of a very different dispensation. Um, and in actually trying to build the South Africa that's actually leading towards a success as it is now, Raja Bidian has been very, very involved in the policy making of this country economically. What is the, the inherent goodness in, in African culture? And it's certainly, it's community and it's mutual support and, and then looking at that in terms of a financial model. Well, how do we harness that? And, and create financially supportive, secure models for people. As one of the many ways that Iraj Abedion contributes to reducing the extremes of wealth and poverty, he is setting up a collective home financing plan to enable lower income members of society to invest and grow financially. It's, it's what we are calling it missing middle. See, if you earn three and a half thousand or less, government gives you a house the RDP houses. If you earn above seven and a half, the banks finance you. But if you earn between four and seven and a half, neither government caters for you nor <coughs> banks find you bankable. And the, who are these people? These are your nurses, these are entry-level teachers, these are entry-level policemen, these are entry-level secretaries. These are really the backbone of the economy. He's making that contribution and the inspiration behind it is actually from a Baha'i point of view. The guidance from the writings here is bestow wealth upon my poor. Not just survival, but wealth. Yeah? I remember when my mother had to uh, literally, from day dawn to dust, uh, make carpet to send me to school. Um, and up to today, it's a vivid picture in front of me. Uh, and through my work, I've, I've tried to, to earn what I can uh, through hard work. Uh, but Unless wealth and money is a ladder for your own progress to contribute more and to be more conscious and to make more service, um, then that wealth is not worth having. Uh, wealth is not an end to itself. It's a means of being able to do more. Accumulation of wealth in itself doesn't actually make the purpose of our existence in this earthly realm um, significant. We were a rich family, we hardly had money, education came a hard way to them. In my early childhood I realised that all things were not actually equal for all children. And in that whole journey also I felt that I was beginning to look out for the underdog. And I found that some of the children, they struggled. Um, to complete their homework. They struggle to understand certain concepts. I was beginning to explore ways of taking um, education more seriously. Tahira Mati's work includes training students who have no experience using digital media such as computers and the internet. I try and give them the skill that they need in a way that is dignified that they don't feel lesser than or lower than anyone else. Although her goal is to help them learn to use the media, she also integrates gender equality and HIV AIDS education into her course. I'm very proud of Toyra. Uh, 
I know she, she's a very dedicated child, but I think the faith was their rock. They became strong and they realized how important the faith is to them. We like having interfaith devotionals um, at our home. I particularly liked um, the ornamental uh, Buddha. This is one of my favorite books that I would place on the table. I really value the sacred verses that are shared uh, in this book. I couldn't dream one day that I will see interfaith being brought into South Africa and the different religions mixing together. I understand that this is what Baha'u'llah is saying to me through the writings, that I must not make a distinction between any one of God's divine educators. Tahira Mati believes in the essential oneness of all religions, but finds that the Baha'i faith offers the most relevant and recent practical guidance for today's problems. In the practical application of the Baha'i Faith, I see um, some differences that sets the religion apart from the previous divine teachers texts and one of the profound differences would be in the social teaching of the equality of gender. This is an explicit text in Baha'i writings. This is a fundamental shift in the way that the religion operates within its ad administration it is very explicit in the way that it begins to operate at the, at the level of family life. I'm consciously designing projects in such a way that it makes it possible for the girl student to enter the program and for the girl student to exit successfully. This is us walking with my dad on the beach. In my speech to my parents with their 50th anniversary, I was saying that my dad was at least three decades ahead of his time. Because when other men were interested, you know, in just sort of the manly, in inverted commas kind of stuff, my dad was sort of really, really putting into practice the equality of, of, of gender, you know, and relieving my mother of all the, the domestic chores and joyfully taking care of us. Another teaching that is explicitly realized in Baha'i communities around the world is racial unity. So the first time I went into my home, I was walking in there expecting this feeling. But when I got there, I didn't get it. So that's what caught me the first time. It was I felt like I was being accepted fully like an equal here. The early Baha'i communities worked hard to maintain and celebrate their race unity during apartheid. In those days, the Baha'is stuck to the letter of the law, but uh, they didn't really stick to the spirit of the law. When Baha'is first organized in South Africa, their governing body consisted of black, white, and colored members, reflecting the diversity of their community. And as we drove along, people drove past us and were craning their necks to see a white person sitting in the back of a black person's car. The 
The first election of the governing body, known as the National Spiritual Assembly, took place under great precautions. As historical accounts of the time relay, Baha'is gathered in a farmhouse. If the security police approach, the African Baha'is began cleaning and cooking, while the white Baha'is played cards and socialized. Such were the realities of the time. And when we came into this center, the white people came in by the front door, the black people by the back, and that's how the mixed colored National Assembly worked. But the Baha'is were not only challenged by apartheid, prevalent religious prejudices often made it hard for people to embrace this new faith without being rejected from their former communities. Was it difficult with your friends? Oh, yeah, that, that way, yes. We had, um, we had difficulty because of us becoming Baha'is. They used to cross the road. Mm. When they see you, they mm. walk another way. Mm. They want to see you. Mm. They want to talk to you. Mm. Mm. Such prejudices have taken the form of persecutions in some parts of the world. For example, in Iran, where the Baha'i faith is the largest religious minority. The following is an account by an Iranian Baha'i who was in prison on charges of apostasy. The footage was taken while he was under house arrest, waiting to be transferred to a new prison. I've been in prison for seven years and eight or nine months. Three and a half years I served in a labor camp. My sentence was completed four months ago, yes, but they're still holding me and won't release me because I'm a Baha'i. Two years after this interview, this Baha'i died in prison under unknown circumstances. Many human rights organizations, such as Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, continue to raise awareness of the situation of Baha'is in Iran. For example, UN Special Rapporteur Asma Jahangir made public a confidential letter by Iran's armed forces, which called for Baha'is to be singled out and observed. Other reports detail that persecutions have spilled into the school system. Um, in primary schools, what they're doing is they're singling out Baha'i children, bringing them to the front of the class and telling, telling them off, swearing at their religion and demanding that they renounce their faith uh, in Baha'u'llah. Followers of every religion experience persecutions at some point in their history. This happens every time a new divine teacher appears in the world. So every manifestation of God throughout time has been persecuted. It's a commonality of the manifestations. They've all been persecuted because they shake up the status quo and they ask people to relook at their own dynamics. They ask people to question dogma, to question reality and to see again, where is truth really taking me? Exploring truth is a personal task in the Baha'i faith, which does not have a clerical hierarchy. The fact that the Baha'i administration or the Baha'i community doesn't have a, a, a clergy figurehead does not mean that the functions of what previously were performed by clergymen are, have disappeared. And to prevent the formation of a clerical elite, Baha'is conduct their community affairs through an administrative order meticulously outlined in their teachings. This order consists of assemblies and bodies on local, national, and international levels. An assembly is elected democratically without campaigning or nominations. Believers pray and meditate before voting for nine members who they feel would best serve the community. Their vote is confidential and no individual is considered superior to another. Wealth, education, personal status, and alliances play no part. So assemblies are often comprised of members who represent a wide, diverse cross-section of humanity, including and encouraging women and minorities. 
This links with the Baha'i principle of universal education. Baha'u'llah said that in this day and age, all of society would need to be educated so they could develop their own insight and understanding into the holy writings. This way everyone could read the Word of God and independently decide on the issues of life through prayer, reflection, and consultation with others. Look at me. Mama Yunus contributes to this process by educating children who would otherwise be left on the street. Uh, this is a poisteometry. This is our kitchen. This is our big pot because we are the big family. We like her children, all of us. When I need something, just tell her. She gives me everything. She makes sure that I don't get hurt. A few of Mama Eunice's children are already expressing aspirations to excel in their future careers. Uh, I want to be an advertising executive, but I want to do media studies. At the moment, I'm having this congratulation letter from Edu College. I'm so proud. Baha'u'llah's teaching that uh, women as the prime educators of children have such an important role and must themselves be educated as well um, to be able to, to give this first learning to these kids because kids are learning from the very beginning, from the womb even. Mama Yunus not only makes sure her children excel academically but that they also enjoy a spiritual education. Sometimes we are making a uh, uh devotions. We are including some other children from the Orange Farm. Not only Baha'i children, but other churches. We are including them to give them a, 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 a teachings and a devotions here. One day I just said, what is Baha'i? Who is Baha'u'llah? Who is the Bab? She goes like, mm, they were sent, they were sent by God. They are God's children. They came here to teach us how to live life. Before I joined the Baha'i family, I always felt like I was, I don't know, I always felt isolated from other people, but then um, the Baha'is made me feel like any other person. You know, when they first came here, they actually changed my life. Jesus is like Baha'u'llah, the Bab. All of, all of them are the same. They were sent by God. I enjoy to be a Baha'i because of there are people, they are coming to help me with different ways. They not say we are white, we can stay to, to this area of a black people. Oh, these people, they are like this, we can be friend with them. Now, I think Baha'i faith, it's a, 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 a faith that changing the, 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 the situation of poverty and a crime. This is Little Honol, or means lucky. That name was given by me after we find Lin, uh, Little Honol on the floor in the morning there was a, a, a cry that was sound like it's a cat, but it wasn't a cat, it was a human being. These are the leaders of tomorrow. A leader in his field, Iraj Abedian, came from humble beginnings that shaped his desire to create a better world. Well, in my childhood, I was very, um, very influenced by my father, who, although was illiterate, and a common villager was very much a world citizen, uh, and that that shaped my feelings, my my sense of uh, belonging to a bigger, uh, wider village than the village that I saw and experienced. Well, Iraj is just brilliant, isn't he? I mean, as a as a as a financial mind and as an economic an economic mind, he's brilliant. Uh, 
And he's also very sensitive to the needs of the world around him. He's just an amazing people's person. He's got, a, yeah, he's got an edge to him, a slightly irreverent edge, which is also nice. You know, he's a critical thinker and so on. I think that it's a, its ability to connect with a lot of people at the same time. It's, it's a rare gift. He's not a person who proselytizes or pushes that in your face. If you're living with somebody and you see, my God, you know, they actually do pray three times a day and they do fast and they do, I mean, those are the, outward, the outwardly things, you know, which is very impressive for me because I, d I didn't grow up like that. Thank you, Dad, for the difference you have made in my life. Anyone can be a father, but it takes a special man like you to be a dad. You know, Iraj will never, not even to his kids, make a, uh, a, a promise that he can't keep. You can see that underlying him is a, is a philosophy that obviously has very deep roots. I came to touch with the Baha'i face when I was at high school in a very unusual set of circumstances. When I saw some kids are getting beaten up, uh, and when I asked why are they getting beaten up uh, for seemingly done nothing, as I could see it, I was told because they were members of the Baha'i faith. And that attracted me to find out what it's all about. Well, I think that when I first heard that he's a Baha'i, I thought, good God, what is a Baha'i, you know? At the social side, uh, the most beautiful and vivid uh, teachings in the Baha'i faith is to see people as different flowers of the same garden. I think that uh, uh, if I were to uh, subscribe to any religious view, it would be something along those lines, yeah. One of the Baha'i teachings that inform Irajabedian's life is the independent investigation of truth, a process that requires letting go of prejudices and inherited views. The search and quest for justice in today's world um, is essentially squashed by the absence of independent investigation of truth. If you like the herd mentality, uh, the pop mentality, that you want to be popular, you want to go with the crowd, you want to go with what is in vogue, uh, means that truth, more often than not, gets sacrificed. And when the truth is sacrificed, justice is denied. Um, I don't do whatever I do in, to become popular. I sit and say, okay, if I do this thing, and if it's done, will it do good for South Africa? We are a nation in need. We have to seriously ask ourselves, each one, is there something I can do to bring about a change? Every single person on this planet is responsible for everyone else in this planet. We are all dependent on each other. We are all responsible for each other. One of the many ways that the Miti family contributed to nation building was by adopting a girl. Their eldest son had pointed out that the Baha'i teachings view raising another's child as raising God's own child. He asked very emphatically, why in a home where there is so much love, where there's always something for another person, why is it that we are only three children? Shouldn't there be more children? in such a home. To take in a child into my home um, who's been born of another biologically is not the issue. The emphasis on the person's biological offspring is neither here nor there. That's just material. So if I can embrace that soul, you know, as one that has emanated from me, and provide to that soul anything that I would have liked provided to myself. That to me is the essence of our oneness. I consciously took the decision and in consultation with the family that the one who comes will be the one 
who's most needy. What they have done to, um, to apply this principle of, of the oneness of mankind is uh, by not only having their own children, but by adopting a child who was really one of the most difficult cases to deal with in the children's home. The Matisse ended up adopting a girl who suffered from multiple physical and emotional challenges, including a brain tumor. Only a few years earlier, they had faced the diagnosis of brain tumor in their oldest son. He survived and ultimately inspired his family to adopt a child. It is a moment that you cannot actually describe in words. You, you cannot say to a surgeon, if I pay you a million, can you ensure that he comes out alive, well, functioning, the happy, jubilant, joyful child? No one's able to give you that guarantee. And so it's in that moment that I learned my nothingness in relation to the divine. <laughs> I now, in retrospect, understand and value and respect the journey of traveling with my son through not knowing much about brain tumors and what to do uh, post-surgery, I understand now that God was preparing us for the adoption of this very child who would enter our lives much later. And they've raised all these children with so much love, with so much joy, with so much compassion, Every person can be happy when the situation is ideal. But our true nobility lies in the journey of being happy precisely when things are not ideal. The community of South Africa reflects the diversity of the human race. Every culture and language group is represented. Baha'is are found in every province, living in every condition, in every walk of life, raising families, being part of South Africa, embracing the transforming power of unity. I'm deeply an Afro-optimist in the sense that Africa has got both material and spiritual, cultural, moral, ethical resources to put a different set of, of values, both materially and spiritually, on the, on the table. We have given birth as a nation to so many beautiful souls. I'm very grateful that as a nation, we've collectively rejected warfare and that collectively our vision and our focus is on building a new nation through this journey of peace. As we are Baha'i, as we can hold hand, hands and hands to other, another, another one, we can change the poverty and the crime of this earth. The Baha'is don't see themselves as a group of individuals, that if they do more or make more or contribute more or serve more, things will get better by itself. To the extent that the Baha'i faith has got a divine origin, it is the power of divine that has made things happen in history. If we can carry on teaching Baha'u'llah's writings, I 
I think South Africa will become more brighter than was before. My journey and my desire for a better world is about how much I can serve it. Um, as long as I do my best, as long as I do all the ways that I can do, no matter how little it is, uh, what will come out of it is for me a new world.